Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. with elaborate mansions recalling the glory days of the 19th century. Tucked away in the Faubourg Marigny district of Esplanade is a two and a half story Renaissance revival mansion complete with cast iron filigree balconies and cypress shutters, a style typifying New Orleans. Hello, I'm Chef John Foles, welcoming you to the historic French Quarter in the Leno Mansion, a home named after the builder Charles Johnson's first love, Marie Leno. <laughs> This impressive 11,000 square foot Italianate mansion stands on the corner of Chartis and Esplanade and is adorned with wrought iron balconies allowing one to view the New Orleans French Quarter. Owner and local antique collector Ruth Bodenheimer knew she had to own this home after a visit there on her 17th birthday. Purchasing Leno in 1989, Ruth embarked on an ongoing restoration that has consumed her imagination and resources. Priceless items original to the home, such as this gas lantern, is just one of the many treasures Mr. Johnson left behind for the next generation to enjoy. The parlor is filled with period antiques and artwork that were tucked away in the attic. And this incredible 1800s Victorian wallpaper, although in need of repair, exemplifies the details Mr. Johnson paid to his 19th century home. Ruth's decorating expertise came from an already well-trained eye from years at an auction house. But a conversation with a direct descendant allowed her to obtain an 1885 portrait of the original owner, Charles Andrew Johnson further assisting in returning the elegant home to its original grandeur. Guests marvel at this magnificent dining room wrapped in lush red, complete with rosewood table, Chippendale chairs, and a 1700s plate warmer waiting by the fireplace. And y'all, what chef could pass up this little find? An antique silver stag head terrain that surely was delivered to the dining room table filled with New Orleans crab and spinach bisque. I could smell it. Located next to the dining room is this tiny butler's kitchen, a special room that no longer exists in most homes today. What a perfect place to prepare Crescent City beignets, sip a glass of sherry, or store your heirloom china and crystal. Y'all, even back then, nothing was free. This message says it all. The French Quarter Leno Mansion consists of four elegant accommodations. The premier Leno Suite, originally the library, is lavish with its 14-foot ceilings and towering windows overlooking the French Quarter. Prudent Millard furniture is exhibited here in this premier setting, including a hand-carved queen-size bed, ladies' dresser, and armoire. Each suite located in this B&B is equipped with a full-size kitchen, and naturally, everything needed to prepare a romantic breakfast in bed awaits you. And check this out, y'all, a priceless collection of old New Orleans menus framed and preserved for viewing from eateries in and around the city, such as the famous St. Charles Hotel. 
And I just wonder how many servants must have climbed the staircase to Mr. Johnson's quarters. Once again, history preserved. And for you honeymooners, the guest house allows privacy and a trickling water fountain serenades you to sleep. Please, y'all, don't tell me you've lived a single day of your life until you've spent an evening in the Leno Mansion in New Orleans. What a gorgeous place. And you know something else of the hundred, or I guess at least a hundred, probably more, B&Bs that we searched out to, uh, to find just the right 26 that I wanted to use for our wonderful B&B series, Leno stood out as one of the tops. I just absolutely loved it. Not only in a great place, the French Quarter of New Orleans, but the foods were so incredible there as well. And of course, each one of the homes had a great food history associated with it. So what kind of foods would Mr. Johnson have served so many years ago at the Leno Mansion right there uh, in the quarter? Well, one of the dishes that I found actually used that gorgeous stag's head terrine to bring the soup to the table. And that's what uh, I want to show you. The first dish I want to share with you today is this dish. So take a look at my platter here, y'all, because this is the ingredients that I'm sure Mr. Johnson brought into that little butler's pantry to create the fabulous dish known as spinach and lump crab bisque. Now notice all of the different crabs that we have to work with here in Louisiana. Uh, this is the claw crab. I think it's the most flavorful of all of the crab meats. You know, they say the closer the bone, the sweeter the meat. And this right here is the white crab meat, the back fin crab meat, some people uh, will call it. I love this crab as well. But feast your eyes on the pearls of bayou country right here. These wonderful jumbo lumps of crab that often, even in season, will sell for about $16, $17 a pound. They come from the beautiful blue crab, which we have right here, this gorgeous blue crab from the Louisiana bayous. Look at those gorgeous claws here. And I just brought a sample of two other crabs for you to look at. The snow crab as well as the Alaskan king crab because most people are familiar with these uh, uh, two as well. So anyway, that's all of my great ingredients. Of course, I'm going to combine this with spinach, which is found in Louisiana in the spring as well as the fall. Spinach is one of those great, great uh, uh, vegetables that you can use as, what, a salad? You can put it in soup as an item. But I like to eat spinach, just, uh, just a little salt, pepper, vinegar, dipped in vinegar. Mm, great on the front porch on a swing in the springtime. Gorgeous dish. So let's go ahead and make that soup. The first thing I did was to create a wonderful crab stock. If you're going to peel the crabs here in Louisiana, of course, we're going to make a nice stock. So take a look at my pot. I've taken the bodies of the crabs as well as the shells, and I've married that with onion, celery, bell pepper, some bay leaf, some thyme, all of those wonderful flavors, carrots for sweetness. And this becomes uh, the base for my, uh, for my really great uh, soup. So in my cast iron pot, I'm going to begin with a little bit buttery flavored oil. This is one of these uh, vegetable oils that's flavored with a butter resin. You can find it in most of the stores anyway. I'm sure you can go into any of your grocery stores and, uh, and find it. Once your, uh, once your pot is nice and hot, and of course these cast iron pots, I love cast iron as we like to refer to it in Louisiana because it cooks so well. We're going to go ahead and put in equal amounts of uh, onion, celery, bell pepper. We want to throw in, uh, people often ask, how much? How much of each? Well, you know, that's kind of hard to say. I like to use uh, about equal parts of onions and celery. And then, of course, a bell pepper. A lot of people think it's a blanding vegetable. I don't put quite as much in. But in theory, you should use twice as much onions to celery, twice as much celery to bell pepper, and twice as much bell pepper to garlic. So now I'm going to add my colored uh, bell pepper in. I like to use the red as well as the yellow. It gives me a really nice uh, uh, look down into that pot. And this is starting to simmer now. I can hear the cast iron starting to simmer nicely. I'm going to add my garlic and y'all lots of it. Go ahead and throw in lots of garlic down into that pot. Uh, the more the merrier when it comes to garlic. So I'll tell you that around and this is all of the basic flavors of great Louisiana soup making. Now I have to throw in, huh, let's throw in some of it. Let's sacrifice some of this wonderful claw crab meat right down into here. And I'll also throw some spinach. I'll throw a little bit spinach down into it because that's going to create the flavor that I'm looking for. If you want to do a crab soup or chicken soup, go ahead and add 
the chicken or the crab at this point and pull out all of that nice, wonderful flavor. Okay, let's say that this is uh, saute it here for a little while because remember, this is a soup. It's going to cook for about 10 or 15 minutes. All of the flavors are going to marry well in the pot. So you want to kind of put something in here to thicken it up nicely. Just go ahead and really get it uh, thickened up nicely here by adding a little bit flour to it. So I'm going to take a little touch of flour, sprinkle right into the soup. How much flour? Well, about a cup of flour will thicken about two, two and a half quarts of stock to a really, really nice soup consistency. So I'm going to add about that much flour in there. Or if you want to judge it from look, let's go ahead and add, put a, add enough flour to pick up the oil that's in the bottom of the pot, and that way you won't have any oil floating on the top. So once that's in, now I can add a little touch of my stock. Of, I have some in the pot nice and hot, but I also have some already here in that uh, little pitcher. So I'm going to add a little bit stock into my pot. It's already nice and warm. So I'm going to stir that around. You want to blend all of those flavors together nicely. You can see this is called a velouté, what you see here, a velvety soup. Very, very nice. Look at the colors in that soup as well, y'all. So once uh, the soup goes, uh, once the stock goes into the soup, now I can go ahead and put in some nice chiffonade of spinach. This is a really nice uh, fresh chopped spinach. Make sure you wash this stuff about 10 times too, y'all, because you're going to have, you know how grit and sand uh, comes about through, uh, through a little uh, on the spinach leaves. So get it out of there. Now the lump crab, you, oh my God, throw some in there and I'll move this out of the way. And then I would want to bring this to a nice simmer. As you can see, it's starting to simmer. I would let this cook for a couple of minutes, season it with salt and pepper. Remember, the crab stock is flavored really nicely, so that's going to already be, uh, uh, be full of flavor. And then the crab and the spinach will cook here for about another, I guess, 10 to 15 minutes to simmer nicely. Then to season it, salt, pepper, Herbs, your favorite herbs, basil, thyme. I like to use a little fresh tarragon that's always nice and crab. And then I'll put it in here. And y'all, let it cook for about 30 minutes. Those jumbo lump crabs, those little pearls are going to cook so nicely. Finish it with a little cream if you want to. Make sure you don't over season it. It's going to be beautiful. Let me show you what it looks like inside of this great terrine. Take a look at this. You see that terrine? Victorian, right out of the house. This was uh, in, in that period of the Lenoa Mansion back in about 1879. Isn't that gorgeous? And look at that soup inside the terrine. Absolutely stunning. Garnish it with a little lump crab as well. Beautiful dish, y'all, right out of the French Quarter of New Orleans. Now, my next dish I want to show you is, this is one of those dishes I think that a lot of people may have a little problem determining whether they like this, uh, this meat. This is veal sweetbreads, and I want you to take a look at my sweetbread. This is a classical platter, y'all, classical platter out of early New Orleans. Veal sweetbread is the thymus gland from all suckling calves, especially the young veal calf. You also get the thymus gland in other animals as well. But I'm going to go ahead and take this. Once it's been poached, you see this is, uh, let's go back to that platter for a minute. This is the raw one you see right here. This is raw. This is poached. It has the skin still on it. I've peeled the skin off here, and then I've sliced it. You see how in the uh, inside it's still slightly, uh, slightly pink. It's rare, and I'm putting it into a little seasoned flour here. It's about four pieces. This cooks so quickly. And then you just want to dust it in the seasoned flour. Veal sweetbreads, how do you butcher, prepare these for you? They're easy to find all over the place. You don't have to hunt for them. Every butcher shop will have them. Now to saute them, I'm going to put a little bit more of my buttery flavored oil right into my pan here. And hopefully that pan will be nice and, nice and hot. You want to take the sweetbreads, put them into that 350 to 375 degree heat and let them brown lightly on each side. They're already poached. So you want to remember, since they're already poached in a nice cubillon, which is made with uh, water, a little bit wine, carrots, celery, onion, garlic, put all your nice flavors. You make a poaching liquid, and then you take the sweetbreads, put them in there just for about five or 10 minutes until they get kind of, kind of nice uh, firm to the touch, and then they're ready to go into the saute pan. So look here, y'all. Flour already seasoned. So I'm going to go ahead and add the sweetbreads 
right to it. And of course, uh, this can be uh, served as an appetizer. It can be served as an entree. Uh, either one, I like to serve uh, serve it either way. Uh, but just let it uh, get nice and golden brown on each side. And once they're brown on each side, what do we flavor them with? And I'll watch these and flip them over in just a second. Well, you want a nice citrusy flavor. So I like to put in lemon juice. I like to put in capers. I like to put in some nice lemon. Finish it with cream right at the end. In fact, let me flip these over for you because they ought to start getting nice and brown right on the other side already. And let's assume that these are just about cooked. I'm going to go ahead and put my capers in here. I'm going to put a little lemon juice to kind of put a little citrusy flavor in. The capers right on into it like this. A little bit of those nice chives. Boy, look at that sizzle and lemons. Now, y'all, I'm going to plate this up in just a minute so you can see it. But you know, one of my favorite desserts of all is Riole, the rice custard of early New Orleans. And I went on to the Leno Mansion and had Ruth Bordenheimer, one of the best cooks in the world, show me exactly how to make it. So why don't you come and jump in the car. Let's go on over there and let Ruth share her great recipe with us. You won't want to miss it. Ruth, you've done a great job of converting this nice little butler's pantry into a fantastic kitchen. I'm going to put it to good use now with a rice pudding or riole from early in New Orleans. Now, you flavor this rice in a special way. Very special. A little sugar. A little sugar yeah. in the place of salt. Well, it is a dessert, well, isn't it? Rice very, pudding. Very... I'm going to begin by putting in, as you as you've uh, taught me here, about two, two cups, cups of milk. Of milk. Mm -hmm. And uh, now this would have been the perfect dessert for early Creole New Orleans, right? It certainly would have been the perfect dessert. And it was used because in the wintertime it was very warm, it was very nourishing, and in the summertime you could eat it cold. So it, it had a dual purpose to it. And with so much rice in Louisiana and cream and eggs, oh my God, it had to be just uh, on every table exactly. in early New Orleans. Now, uh, the, the two cups of uh, milk are simmering with the cooked mm -hmm. rice at this point. I'm using a long grain right. rice. Now, let's put the rest of the flavoring ingredients in. Okay, we'll start with a little nutmeg here, which is very, very good. Yeah, just pop that You'll in put that over there, Sure, please. absolutely. And next? And the next, of course, would be the um, orange citrus, citrus, which is great. It's now, great. that's an interesting flavor. Yeah. It's, it's also, it was a, everyone had in their kitchen. You had always had some type of citrus. You always, always had milk, you had eggs, and you had rice. It was very staple foods. And, the, and you know the Spanish brought over the uh, uh, oranges and mandarins. Correct. And so that's a natural flavor for a rice custard in Louisiana. Right. And now the last ingredient is? The last ingredient, of course, would be the vanilla. And uh, which is very, you smell it? Oh, mm. I can sm mm, <laughs> smell it, can great. I? <laughs> but I tell you, this kitchen is just a really nice, uh, uh, nice fragrance yes. of, this, of the cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice flavor. Right. And then, of course, this nice uh, uh, vanilla. Now, this would uh, cook for just a couple of minutes. The couple rice comes to a boil. Yes. And why don't you start that? I'm going to add the final ingredient. Okay, that's because, the eggs. Now, remember, we've got to be very careful because this can only cook for one minute. If we cook it any longer, we're going to have fluffy scrambled eggs. <laughs> so we have to be real careful yeah. and just going to get that. If you'll help me with that, Joan. Absolutely. Okay. So bring it to a rolling boil, right. and then we would put it uh, into a container and That's then correct. in the refrigerator to chill overnight, and That's we have correct. a wonderful custard. Well, you know what I love about this dessert? It's a simple, very, very primitive almost yes. dessert of New Orleans but when served in a gorgeous Victorian platter with uh, silver serving pieces and some really nice uh, uh, goblets to Changes put the flavor. Oh my God, it <laughs> becomes the most elegant of New Orleans That's centerpiece uh, desserts. So, uh, you know, I can't wait to sink my teeth into it. Ah, I wish y'all could smell this great citrus, the lemon coming out of these uh, sweet breads. And I've garnished them with just a little bit of the purple cabbage. And take a look at it. The capers have been finished with just a little bit cream, and I've garnished them with a caper berry. And this is a really nice little berry you can find pickled in many of the stores right in a jar. And as I say, two of these on an appetizer plate, four of those as an entree. What a magnificent classical finish to any meal. And maybe if, uh, maybe at the Leno House, who knows, you might be able to get some of this if you twist Ruth's arm just a little bit. A couple other dishes, y'all, that I discovered while rummaging through all of those menus on the wall over there, and you'll enjoy that. Let's take a look at them right here. I have a great platter, if you can imagine this right here, griot, Spanish style, with a little bit of the 
black olives and basil and cooked in a nice rich Creole sauce. Grits, of course, you always want to serve that next to it. And look at this little terrine here. I'm going to pull the top off of this wonderful chicken and sausage fricassee. Absolutely fantastic. Great foods from the Lano Mansion in New Orleans. Now, y'all, what do you do with a good plate of Riole after it's done? Well, you get a cup of coffee. You serve yourself up a nice portion, and you walk into a magnificent parlor and share it with Ruth. Why don't y'all come and join us? Ruth, it's amazing how a simple dessert like a riole or rice pudding could just be so magnificent and taste so great. You're absolutely right, John. Just think, this particular dessert has been prepared in this house for well over 100 years. Well, I tell you, I'll keep that recipe with me for a long, long time. Ruth, the uh, area of New Orleans that this beautiful mansion is located in is called the Faubourg Marigny District. Where did that name come from? Well, Faubourg meaning neighborhood. It was on the outskirts of the French Quarter, and Marigny was a huge plantation. It, it encompassed several miles around here, and Marigny was said to be one of the richest millionaires at the age of 15, and of course lost all his money quite Freely and so fastly. Like gambling. <laughs> gambling and a few other vices that he certainly enjoyed. Uh, now, you know, this, this home should be called the uh, Charles Andrew Johnson Mansion, but in fact it's not. It's named after a beautiful young lady, right? Well, Charles, yes, you're absolutely right. It's Maria Andrew Lino. Charles Andrew Johnson built the house in 1879, and he lived here for a very short period of time. When he passed away, he left his entire fortune to Marie Andrew Lino, who was his business partner's daughter. Aha, uh -huh. is there a story there? Well, I'm not quite sure. We could maybe ask Mr. Johnson, and I, I do feel that one day he is going to tell me about it. But Mr. Uh, Gaston, I know, had told me many times that um, the family talked about it. They always wondered why he left his entire fortune to his business partner's daughter. So we'll let everyone draw their own conclusion. <laughs> now, you were telling me on my first visit here that uh, uh, that when you walked into this house as a young girl many years ago, you knew that one day you would own it. Well, I just wished that one day I would own it. I didn't actually think that day would ever come. But I always tell people, dare to dream the impossible because it does come true. Now, the furniture in here is just exquisite. The piece is magnificent. Uh, are they original to the house? Yes, actually, the chairs that we're seated on were actually selected by Mr. Johnson because he was a bachelor. So therefore, when he built this grand house, and selected all the furniture. It was he himself who, who did this. Um, the sofa, the chairs, and several other pieces were found in the attic in 1991. Totally reconstructed, they had totally fallen apart, and of course, here, here we enjoying them today. Now, now let's talk about the, the condition of the home. When I, when I look around, it's as if the place was uh, just built, just uh, open to the, uh, uh, to the family yesterday. It's uh, just so magnificent. But what was the condition of the house uh, when you bought it? And uh, then I also have to ask you to <laughs> share with me, if you would, the cost of this renovation. Well, I'll take the questions from the back. I, first of all, I, w I can't share with you what it costs because I don't know. Recently, I was asked how much money has been poured into the house for renovation. And I really can't answer that question. And really, it's not an important question. Because this house, I, I view as a spoiled child. So therefore, we don't usually calculate money that we spend on, <laughs> on, on our hobbies and, and spoiled children. But uh, it's, it's been quite a bit. But I'm not quite sure. And what was that with the condition? Tell me, tell me how you found the house. Well, actually, structurally, the house was in excellent condition. The house, these particular rooms were closed up for about 50 years. And so therefore, it didn't suffer from some, it, a numerous people coming in and changing and um, destroying it, actually. And if you look above our heads, you'll see one of those original things, and that's the wallpaper on the ceiling. It's just absolutely exquisite. Now, you know, I've stayed in the Enchanted Cottage, and I tell you, <laughs> what a haven for honeymooners. It's a beautiful place. But if you had one room, now you have four great that's suites correct. here, but if you had one room to call your own, your favorite, which would it be? Well, it would be the Lano Suite, which is at the head of the stairs. And uh, originally, it was Mr. Johnson's library. The room is approximately 18 by 30. And it's gigantic. It's decorated in beautiful Milan furniture, uh, a great deal of art, oriental carpeting. And I like to think that is my favorite because it's so grand and it's so large. And also, it's where Mr. Johnson had his law library. Well, you have, you have so many exquisite pieces from, uh, from uh, small photographs to lamps. The, the Victorian look in the house is exquisite. You also have a portrait of the builder. 
Mr. Charles Andrew Johnson, right? That was discovered in 1991, about 30 miles from here. And he left the house in 1953 for the very first time. And uh, he came home 38 years later. Gave him a grand par birthday party. He was 172 on January the 20th. And the invitation read, Welcome home, Mr. Johnson. You've been absent for 38 years. <laughs> well, I tell you, you have done a magnificent job with the house, and I can't thank you enough for allowing us to be a part of it and for us spending the night in one of these great rooms, and I would recommend it to the world. So, Ruth, thanks a lot. And thank all of you for dropping by as we visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and continue to cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Why not have a little bit of this rice pudding? Eh? To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folsom Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Folsom is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarans Authentic New Orleans Style Dinner Mixes. Zatarans, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.